Welcome to the very first episode of Autism Unpacked. I'm Rosie Gilmoss, your host, and I'm excited to embark on this journey with you as we explore the many facets of autism from diagnosis, education and beyond. My passion for this podcast comes from both personal and professional experience. I'm neurodivergent myself and two of my four children are neurodivergent. This podcast is a way to offer support, understanding and practical advice to anyone navigating their own journey. In today's episode, we're diving into a crucial topic, understanding and obtaining an autism diagnosis. This can be one of the most daunting steps for parents, but it's also a critical one in ensuring that your child receives the right support. I'm joined today by two experts who are deeply committed to this cause. I've got Emma, the Managing Director of Options Autism, who has years of experience helping families navigate the diagnostic process. I've got Freya, Chief Clinical Officer, bringing her extensive experience in autism diagnosis, offering a clinical perspective that's both insightful and compassionate. Together, we'll be discussing everything from recognising the early signs of autism to navigating the often complex diagnostic process and what happens next. I'm thrilled to have you with us and I hope that this conversation provides the clarity and confidence you need as you support your child. So let's get started. First of all, let me introduce to you Freya. Hi Freya, do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about who you are? Hi Rosie, yeah, I am um, work in Options Horses. I'm their Chief Clinical Officer. I am a clinical psychologist by trade. I've worked in autism services pretty much my whole career. It's always been my intense area of interest. I've always wanted to specialise in that area. Um, I think working in special education with a range of autistic students, range of neurodivergent young people, allows me to kind of really think about how we can get the best support for young people uh, you know, early on. And are you going into the schools and meeting with the children or are you informing their care through the schools? Um, so I suppose I used to go into the schools and I used to work really very closely with the young people. Um, now I lead a team of clinicians who work directly with the young people. Thank you so much for being here. Before we dive in, could you share a little bit about what drives your passion for this work and why you believe, the un- uh, why you believe understanding the autism diagnosis process is so crucial? We start with you, Emma. So I'm the Managing Director for Options Autism. We've got a number of schools across the country that support autistic children and young people. But I've actually been in the sector for about 20 years and um, have always worked with um, autistic individuals and those with other special needs. I've also got a son who is neurodiverse and other family members. So um, some first-hand experience there too. What is autism? It's a question that's often asked, so let's get a definition of what autism actually is. So before we kick off, I think it might be helpful if Freya gave us a bit of a description of what autism is, because there's an awful lot of misconceptions out there, isn't there? There is, yeah. Thanks, Rosie. So autism um, is defined by the National Autistic Society as a lifelong condition. Um, It is classed as a disability, although lots of different people have different views on that, um, maybe differently abled, um, that affects how a person views and interacts with the social world around them and also their environment. Um, And I really like the concept of it being a spectrum. Um, I'm going to let Emma talk to us a little bit more about that using a great analogy. So um, quite often, you know, you hear about autism spectrum and you think about that linear process where at at the top you're very autistic and at the bottom of that spectrum you're just a little bit autistic and that's actually a really big misconception it it is a line of of different um social and environmental barriers that an autistic individual may face so if you think of the front of an oven um you've got different knobs on the front of that oven so if we say each knob on the oven is a or each dial on the oven is a Um, a barrier that an autistic individual may face. So one might be social communication, one might be sensory issues in the environment, one might be um, communication interaction with peer groups. And all it is is that those dials are turned up to certain levels depending on that individual. So you could have one autistic individual who really struggles with social communication. So that dial's really turned up, but their sensory dial is is less so. So they're actually, they don't really have any sensory issues. And another individual, actually the dial's turned up in every single area and they struggle with a number of aspects of, of life and um, the environment and social situation around them. The terms neurodiversity and neurodivergent are now widely used, so we're going to explore where they came from and what they mean 
So I myself, um, I'm neurodivergent. I'm diagnosed with both ADHD and autism. So I tend to use the term neurodivergent because it encompasses many different brain types, but most people will primarily know it as being a, 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 de a, a description for autism and ADHD. So actually, Freya, would you just mind telling me a little bit more about what the term neurodivergent means? Yeah, no problem, Rosie. So the, the term was first coined by Judy Singer in the 1980s, who herself was autistic. Um, and she was looking at how um, humans have a range of different biodiversity. So we have people who are tall, people who are not so tall, different hair colors, you know, loads of different um, physical diversities. And what she wanted to do was really capture how actually everybody's brains and minds are different as well. So she came up with the term neurodiversity. Um, and now it's, a, you know, a really widely used term to talk about those people, as you were saying, who have those different kind of brain types, who maybe are autistic, have ADHD. Um, and it's around thinking about that maybe you do see things a little bit differently you do your brain does process information a little bit differently you may have different sensory experiences so the the, the term is neurodiversity and as people we are neurodivergent um, and every brain is different you know that that refers to whether we are neurotypical or whether we're neurodivergent every brain on the planet is different and unique now let's look at some of the reasons you may want to get a diagnosis for your child some things I wanted to talk to you about today, um, primarily I want to focus on diagnosis and the diagnosis process. Now, a common misconception is that labelling a child with autism, with ADHD, is kind of, there's, there's a negative connotation with that. You know, you're giving them a lifetime label and often they're too young to consent. So, I have been labelled, I've been labelled with autism and ADHD, proudly so, but as a teenager I was labelled with various things, potentially borderline personality disorder, um, eating disorders, depression. So in your view, and I'm going to come to you Freya first, what would you say, would you, what would you say are the primary reasons that you would want to get your child a diagnosis? Yeah, thanks Rich, I think that's a really, really important question. Uh, I think for me, one of the main reasons I would say to a family member or a parent or carer who was seeking a diagnosis for their child, where they'd seen that maybe the child was maybe dis, um, developing in a slightly different way compared to their peers, is I think about what they were hoping to get from the diagnosis. Um, and I think for me, a diagnosis can bring lots of different benefits. So it can bring uh, the family a really good opportunity to understand that child's unique strengths and needs. It can bring the right educational support for that child. And I think more importantly for me, it's about that child really understanding their own identity. If you continually compare yourself to your peers who are neurotypical, you're going to kind of feel a little bit rubbish because you're not going to be the same as them. And you may always feel like you're falling short. If you actually realize, do you know what? My brain is neurodivergent. I'm a little bit different. I do things a little bit differently. Suddenly it's not that I'm rubbish. It's that I'm different. And I think that for me is so empowering. And we know that young people who get an early diagnosis actually go on to get, have, you know, experience less mental health health conditions, they have better well-being, and they have better sense of self-esteem. And these things are crucial for us. And I think the misdiagnosis that you've experienced, I think that's really unfortunate for many people because they've had diagnoses where they've you know, had to have, say, treatments or attempts for things to, to change. Whereas actually, if we embrace someone's neurodivergence, we're not looking at change. We're not looking at deficits anymore. We're looking at difference. And that allows us to think about reasonable adaptions for the environment around us, reasonable adaptions for the people around us, but also things that we can do ourselves. What are the things that we need to do that we maybe need to learn new skills at? And what are the things that we just need to, you know, embrace and celebrate about ourselves? Yeah, I, I completely agree because there's a lot of um, self um, criticism in the autistic mind and actually giving yourself that empathy and the understanding, you can only do that if you know who you are. So it's and it's different, not less, isn't it? That's a really nice um, way to describe it. Possible traits or indicators. We're moving on now to talk about the traits and indicators most commonly associated with autism. Now, um, Emma, I wanted, I know most of our listeners will be very aware of autistic traits mm -hmm. and um, indicators that might be showing in, in children, but there will also be some listeners that aren't familiar with them. And I wondered whether you could just give me a little bit of an idea of what you perhaps would be looking for if you, in an autistic child, what, tra what traits or indicators might signify that you might be wanting to pursue a diagnosis? Of course. So I think the first thing, Rosie, is to say that every autistic individual is an individual and they are unique. So there isn't a, you know, a set criteria um, 
in terms of what you see, um, there are some indicators and they might not like to wear the clothes might have issues with their socks. I know that my son socks, used yeah. to hate wearing <laughs> socks um, and, socks. and touching grass as well was a, was a big thing for him. Um, other things could, could be not being able to make friends, not having friendship groups, or they may attempt to make friends, but just just not form those bonds. Um, there are a number, of, a number of things. Delayed speech is obviously one that that comes up a lot. However, I think we know have to be cautious with that because everyone develops at different times. But um, there are a range of of identifiers that you could be looking at. But I think as a parent, you usually, usually. know that something is probably quite not quite right. In and often if it's, if it's your first child, of course, you mm -hmm. haven't got anything to compare against. It's only when you no. perhaps start going to play groups. And it's often why the differences will sort of start to be picked up at a school, because that's when they're around their peer groups mm. and you can see where perhaps they are showing slight differences. And it's interesting you said there about things like social communication and not talking, mm -hmm. because I have a, um, a neurodivergent daughter. She's just about to turn seven and she spoke very young, very chatty, very exactly. sociable, very academic. And it's only because I was very aware of the fact that she might be neurodivergent that I was able to spot it. So it's actually quite difficult to spot if, if you've got what the terminology is masking. If you've got yes. a high masking child, then it's even harder and to spot, isn't it? We yeah, we see that a lot. Uh, you know, I give you a personal example. Um, my son's a lot older now. Um, and this happens with a number of children that come into our schools is that um, I remember getting called into his nursery and um, told do you know what? He's not going out at break time. All he wants to do is sit and chat to the adults. So, you know, he was absolutely fine to talk to everyone, but not his peers. Yeah. So again, there were, you know, small little indicators that something is different, but doesn't, you know, there is no one box fits, fits all in that sense. Um, teachers are receiving more training when it comes to understanding autism and how that impacts individuals. Um, so, Schools and nurseries are definitely becoming more aware of, of what to look for, but it is a, a challenging time, you know, and something that's difficult to navigate. And it, like you said, it, it is a spectrum and it presents so differently because even with my son, so I'm, he was diagnosed uh, seven years ago. And when the, um, the psychologist came to the house, because I came to the house and she said at the end of the, the assessment, oh, I think you're probably looking at autism. And I just looked at her very blankly and said, but he makes eye contact and he doesn't line up trains mm -hmm. because as far as I was concerned, those were autistic traits because I exactly. knew so little, which is why I think podcasts like this are incredibly valuable mm. because you might be looking at your child and thinking, why are they naughty? And I'm using that word in inverted commas. Why are they, you know, why am I having to ask them eight times to put their shoes on when my mm -hmm. other child, I only have to ask five, let's be realistic, mm -hmm. nobody puts them on first. Um, and it just, it's these little indicators that perhaps we need to be more aware of. And it's brilliant that schools are becoming more mm -hmm. uh, adept at spotting it. But we all know, and listeners will know that, you know, particularly mainstream schools, they often do miss them because they're teaching classes of 30. How to get a diagnosis. There are a number of steps to think about when getting a diagnosis. So let's consider what they are. Now, Freya, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the diagnosis process. So people um, will probably be aware that it is a long, arduous process to get a diagnosis through the NHS at the moment in this country. Um, what would you recommend to somebody who, say, for example, you have a child, they're in primary school, you are starting to notice that they're struggling a little with social interaction, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to pursue the idea of a diagnosis. Perhaps you've done an online screen, you know, we've, we've all done those, <laughs> haven't we? So what, what would you, how would you direct people next? Yeah, I think the first case for me would be to have a, a chat with your child's teacher mm -hmm. or your Senko to think about kind of what was going on in school. So you could get a really good sense of them both at home and at school. So you're kind of getting that really full rounded picture. Uh, again, as we've already talked about, masking and camouflaging are are things that autistic young people do. So, that you know, be aware that school may not have always noticed the same things that you're noticing. Mm. Um, and also school is a very structured environment. So sometimes young people feel really safe there because they know what's expected of them. And they know the predictable part of the day. Um, the other thing that I was thinking is that it would be really useful to go to talk to your GP 
your GP will be able to provide you um, examples of where you can go and seek an assessment from your local neurodivergent or neurodevelopmental service. Um, and across the country, different CAM services do that differently. So it's really important that you get that local knowledge of where to get that assessment. Um, if you're going to go privately, there's a few things that we really, you know, you really need to consider. Um, you need to be considering that it's a multidisciplinary assessment. So it's not just one professional doing that assessment. It's a group of professionals. So clinical psychologists like myself, speech and language therapists are often involved or occupational therapists. Um, and then it's also important that they look and use follow the DSM. So the yeah. DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We're currently on edition five. Um, and while for me, yes, that is still a little bit deficit led, I think it's an important thing for those diagnoses to be based on that. And that's one of the important things that the NHS will look for if you've had a private assessment. And then the third thing to look for is that those assessments will follow the NICE guidance. So NICE guidance are national um, recognized guidelines across all different mental health and physical health spheres that guide people to know what sort of good practice looks like. Um, so check that your private provider would be following NICE guidance. Um, and then if you're going to have an assessment, I suppose for me, it's really important for you to start thinking as a parent, okay, what, what do I need to be you know, looking out for? What do I need to be thinking about? Maybe looking through some of or baby pictures to remind yourself of developmental milestones, those sorts of things. And I think for me, the other thing that is really important is start to talk to your young person about it. Um, you know, even a little young person, so even someone as young as five might be able to understand that I'm going to go and see somebody and we're going to go and play a game together or we're going to go and do something different. We're going to do some activities um, and something might come out of that. And that's kind of okay, especially for, you know, older children as well, that they've got um, I suppose consent and are informed about the assessment process so they can expect what's going to happen. I think that's just picking up on what you said about choosing the right private um, mm. practitioner if that's what you're going to do is so important. Often I hear from parents that they've got a private diagnosis but actually it was with someone who didn't meet that criteria and it actually hasn't got them any further forward in, in the system as such. So it really, you know, there are a lot of money. Yeah. It's really important to check. And actually uh, some um, private assessments, if you then want to go back into the NHS, will exactly. ask you to be reassessed, won't yes. they? So you might think that you're kind of helping your, your child or yourself mm. sort of through the system, but actually it might delay it in the end. So I've had, um, one of my children was diagnosed with autism through the NHS and then ADHD privately. My daughter, I've gone completely privately for both. I took her in thinking that she was probably going to be diagnosed with ADHD. And they said to me, it was a reputable clinic, and they said to me, um, the ADHD is masking her autism. Yeah. And I thought, gosh, if I had almost missed that, there was no way that was going to get picked up. And it was, they actually said to me, and going back to schools and how they view them differently, you know, does Tabitha move around in her seat? No. And they said during the assessment, they'd never had a child lie on the sofa and put their feet in the bookshelves. And I thought, mm -hmm. it just shows how well they can camouflage when they need to. But I talked to her a lot about it. She knew what we were going to do. I booked, a, it was in Margate. So I booked a hotel. We had a night there. We went to Toys R Us, you know. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> and we actually had a really nice time. And she went back to school the next day, proudly saying, I'm all ADHD. And I just thought, wonderful you know how wonderful to be delighted with a diagnosis because I sort of said to her, you know this it's not a good or a bad thing it's just a thing yeah and I and imagine you know as a young child knowing you felt different and to have it celebrated like that to have somebody say this is we're going to find out just so we know we can help you and you know this is awesome and I think the narrative around diagnosis and what it means to be an autistic person in the world today is changing and it's no longer perceived as as a negative we know that autism is a disability and we know that it comes with challenges really big challenges and I, I I'm reluctant to downplay that and the use of the term superpower sometimes can feel a little bit mm -hmm. like you're downplaying struggles but also that it is it isn't doesn't mean that their life is going to be less no I mean let's you know think about all the people autistic individuals that are famous that have contributed to technology yep. across the world etc you know the world wouldn't be where it is today without those people so actually it is something that 
is different but needs to be celebrated. Yeah, lots of creatives as well. Mm. Uh, I was going to say a story that I often tell young people when I um, share a diagnosis with them um, is a kind of like around it takes a village. Yeah. Um, so if we think about, you know, humans in early history, you'd have lots of different humans with lots of different skills and strengths. You'd have some who were really uh, focused on creating social bonds where they were sitting around the campfires talking to one another. You'd have others who were, you know, really important recognizing that actually it takes a long time to get anywhere. So maybe let's invent the wheel. Yeah. Um, and then you'd have somebody who was, you know, going to be the first person that jumped on the cart to trial it. You know, those who are going to be a little bit more impulsive and a little bit more exciting. So I think, you know, it takes a village. We need all these different kinds of brain types to make a really incredible and exciting world. Um, and I think the other thing that she was just, you know, following on from what you've just said, the other thing I'd also look for in a private provider or even an NHS provider is any assessment has that neurodiversity affirming perspective. Yes. So we're not looking at deficits. We're not going to be writing a report that just lists all the things your child can't do. We're going to be looking at all the things your child maybe struggle with and will have barriers with that are needs and needs additional support with. But we're also going to be looking at your child's uniqueness, your child's individuality, your, str your child's strength, the things that they can do better than anyone else and for me I think that's that's one of the most important things that's one of the things I'm extremely passionate about yeah in um my daughter's assessment actually at the end they said uh they recommended some reading um and, one of the, and they really celebrated her you know and it, in in the report it says what a loving engaging intelligent articulate you know, all these wonderful words it, as a neurodivergent parent you you get used to the negatives you know disruptive you know uh, the times I was sent to pick up my my son from school so to actually have all those positives written down and we've gone through it together as well she's you know she's not seven yet but she's um she's very very articulate <laughs> so she's able to understand and I think sitting with them and making them part of the process is really fundamental and I know that's something that you guys believe in as well isn't it it's it's talking to the young person in no matter how old they are because chances are they can understand a lot more than you think and they'll already be aware that they feel a bit different yeah so actually you're not telling them they're different you're just confirming why they're different which is really empowering for them is it also gives them the confidence to explain to other people yeah. be it school teachers um their friends or even you know as they get older in the workplace that this is why they're different <laughs> and that that needs to be accepted and adaptations made. The assessment process. There are several aspects to the autism assessment process. We're going to discuss those now. And and so if, if you are looking um, to have a diagnosis, either for yourself or for your child, then what would you say would be the sort of the, the process? Where, where do you begin and, and how does the process work? Yeah, so the assessment process would start with you having a little bit of a think about um, sort of differences that you're experiencing. So you can start to kind of pull together your own thoughts, your own experience, either about yourself, if it's an assessment for yourself, or, you know, about your child's experiences. Um, and then the assessment process would take up a few different perspectives, a few different aspects, really. So one of those would be a full neurodevelopmental um, family history. So they'd be looking at your own differences. Um, so let's say we'll just talk at the moment about an assessment for a child. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, you'd be going through the developmental stages of your, your child, you know, what the, what the pregnancy was like, what the birth was like, um, how they hit their developmental milestones, any differences you noticed, whether those were strengths or whether those were areas of need, any delays you might have noticed. Um, and they would go right up to kind of like current, um, they would go right up to the current date. So your child's whole life would be discussed with you as a parent. Um, another section of the assessment would be either a play-based or interview with the young person themselves, depending on their age and stage. Um, for me, it's really important that that session is always very much child-led. So there are um, kind of goal-based standards uh, of assessments out there. So there is an assessment called the ADOS. So families may hear that term being used. The ADOS stands for the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, um, but it isn't the only one out there. There are lots of other observational assessments that you can do as a clinician, whether you be a speech and language therapist or a psychologist that would work on um, you know, different ways of interacting with a young person. So in a, you know, in a, um, maybe a, a, an assessment with a young person, for example, we might be playing bubbles and kind of doing, you know, one, two, three, and the young person will go, yay. Mm. Whereas an autistic young person might go one, two, three, four. <laughs> What? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? I'm not interested in this. So there's loads of different things that we look for. Um, and as the children and the, or the child or the young person gets older, we'd be having more of that conversational with them. 
So we'd be asking them, you know, how are your experiences of school? What do you like about being with your friends? What are some of the things you may find tricky? Um, what are your intense interests? What are the things that you love and are passionate about more than anything else? So there's a whole load of things that we would do as part of that young person's assessment to really better understand that young person's experiences, really. Um, we would also reach out to their school. So we would talk to their young person's school. We might go and do an observation um, at that young person's school. So the young person wouldn't always know that we were watching. So young people out there, you don't have to be worried <laughs> that there's people spying on you in schools. Um, but it's about really getting an understanding of that young person across a range of different um, areas. So then all that information that would be gathered would then be discussed by what we'd call a multidisciplinary team of professionals. So that basically means when there's one person, there's not one person who has the same profession. So as I was mentioning before, it might be an occupational therapist, a clinical psychologist, a speech language therapist. So you'd have a team of professionals who would discuss all that information. And then what they would do is they would reference that according to the DSM, so the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which we spoke about earlier. And then they would check whether that young person was hitting those diagnostic markers. And I think for me, the diagnostic conversations and the diagnostic formulations I have and I have with my team or when I'm working with students is is something that we've kind of moved away from. Is this not just about different? Is it not just about deficit anymore? This is about difference. Is it rather that this person maybe has an altered quality to their eye contact? So I'm not just saying, you know, oh, their eye contact isn't very good. I'd be saying actually they prefer not to make eye contact. Mm -hmm. Actually, their eye contact is, is, is more fleeting than it is um, constant. So we'd be looking at those sorts of things and we'd go through those diagnostic kind of almost checklists. But again, I always re reassure people a diagnosis isn't a tick box list. It's actually an experience. It is a um, um, it's a holistic view of a person. Once all of that diagnose, um, diagnostic formulation has been gone through, um, we would then meet with the family and the young person. Some young people, depending again on their age and stage, want to be involved in that diagnostic discussion really on. Um, some parents want to have that news first. Um, I assessed a teenager very recently who said to me, I want to know first, this is my diagnosis, so I'm kicking my mum and dad out. So there's loads of different ways. And I think that really has to be led by the family. Um, and then as part of that diagnostic discussion, it's around helping somebody to understand that this isn't a, a new thing. This is something that they've always been. Yeah. It's just a new label. Um, and a sort of a, a phrase that I always find myself saying when I'm doing diagnostic um, feedbacks to people is, I'm not telling you something you didn't already know about yourself because you've told me all this information. You've shared with me your experiences, your reflections about what it is like to be you. What I am doing is I'm giving you a label to kind of understand that so other people can understand you as well. And I think for me, it's that it's that diagnosis that can be so helpful in helping them, you know, move forward. Some people see after they've been through a long um, assessment process or even a long waiting list, that diagnosis is almost the end point. For me, I think that's that's almost the wrong way around of looking at it. The diagnosis needs to be the starting point. This is our starting point of our new lives on a new journey, moving forward with this new understanding of our new identity. Thank you. And that's really interesting you say that because... Um... And again, I'm pulling it back to my personal experience, but I myself went through a period of almost like a grief when I was diagnosed because I look back on this troubled child and I think, God, if only I had known. And also the, the knowledge that you have put on a mask for so many years, you don't actually know who you are anymore. Now, I'm a grown adult. For, I'm thinking for a teenager to have that sort of, you know, that, that, that must be quite challenging for them. But also quite liberating yeah. because I do think if somebody had said to me oh actually your brain works in a different way you're not actually crackers I would have probably quite appreciated that at some points. Overcoming potential barriers. It's not uncommon to encounter barriers along the way to a diagnosis so let's look at what can be done when that occurs. Because I've got some friends who've gone for diagnosis you know we flock together and all that and they've gone to see typically male doctors who have been quite disparaging of them and have sort of said actually you you're in a relationship you make eye contact therefore you can't possibly be autistic so I'm wondering how parents can navigate this if they're pretty certain that they may their child might be autistic but they then are not given that voice in in, a, in an assessment what's what's the next thing they can do after that uh yeah so that that is a common occurrence actually so you know we are at um i would say a crossroads really of 
of diagnosis and understanding neurodiversity and neurodivergence at the moment, I personally think that Crossroads is a really exciting time, but that does mean that you have a variety of professionals with different qualifications, different tr levels of training, different understanding of where they are in the difference, not deficit model. Um, and I think for me, if you are with, uh, you know, if you're having an assessment and you are feeling that you're not being heard, you're feeling that the professionals aren't really understanding you or your child's perspective to really, you know, voice that and say, actually, do you know what? I don't think you're quite understanding where I'm coming from or you maybe need to realize that sometimes my my child, my daughter, my son, um, they may mask their difficulties. Um, they may camouflage, they may, you know, just assimilate. So I think that's something that I know a lot of our autistic young people are really good at doing in schools. We just assimilate into the other people around us. We copy what people are doing. Um, and I think if we can get to that point and have those open and honest conversations with the professionals who are assessing us, hopefully that should allow us to kind of move that assessment forward in a way that's both meaningful um, and gets the right answer for those young people. So just hypothetically, say I'm a parent, I've waited four years for an autism assessment with my child. I were there we're with the clinician and I don't feel that they understand my child mm -hmm. at that point parents are probably thinking well what on earth do I do I can't wait another four years can you insist on having a another a second opinion yes yeah you can so most um neurodevelopmental services so either if you're being assessed as part of a CAMS team so a child and adolescent mental health service or a neurodevelopmental service they will have a second opinion pathway um what I would advise is you go through the whole assessment fully the first time through because if they're having a multidisciplinary team, you may have one clinician who's maybe a little bit doubtful, mm -hmm. but you then may have other clinicians on that team who are going to be able to see different parts of your young person and think, oh, actually, this, this is neurodiversity. It just maybe looks a little bit different yeah. in this young person. Um, so, I'd, yeah, advice to kind of finish that full assessment so you've got all that detail. Go through the report in fine detail to make sure what they've reported in that assessment report is accurate as well to you so they've understood what, what you've said. Um, and if you're still not happy with the conclusion and um, with the assessment, then I would seek a second opinion. And the majority of NHS services will offer a second opinion. And you can even be a little bit more um, specific. And when you ask for a second opinion, you say you would like somebody, say, for example, you're having a, a teenage girl assessed who, you know, often are some of the best maskers out there. Um, but maybe you might say, do you know, what? I'd like a professional involved with my daughter's reassessment that has got specific training in assessing women and girls or has specific training in understanding camouflaging and masking um, so then hopefully you would get the right professionals as part of your assessment team so you're saying basically don't be afraid to ask if you don't if you dispute the diagnosis or lack of diagnosis don't be afraid to, to ask and, and, and advocate yeah definitely I think that's you know I think that's um, that's with well within your rights to kind of question. Obviously, they're professionals; they're within their rights to have a diagnostic decision. Um, but yeah, please feel that you can, you know, you can ask, you can challenge. Um, sometimes it might be watchful waiting as well. So sometimes, as clinicians, yeah, at the end of the day, these are lifelong diagnoses. Mm -hmm. We don't want to get it wrong. So if we were assessing somebody and we were thinking, Do you know what, there, there are there are bits here, but that we're not a hundred percent sure, we might suggest a period of like twelve months watchful waiting, and that isn't a no. That's just as saying, do you know, we want to really get this right for you guys. But these are, you know, this is the recommendations. These are the personal profile that we can do in the meantime that will support your young person at school and at home. Um, and then you know, by all means come back in in you know 12 months time to relook at that what we often find is you know some children who are developing at different levels it may mean that you know as their peers are sort of developing in a certain trajectory it may mean that their their trajectory is slightly different and as the trajectories and the development between their their peers of themselves becomes wider sometimes that's when you can see more of those differences um, and sometimes that's when they can have more of those impact so there's there's a couple of different routes or things to consider if you are getting a, a no or a not yet. Diagnosis opens up a whole new world for individuals and their families. So now we talk about the impact and the next steps. Because one of the primary reasons a lot of parents will pursue a diagnosis for a child is because we're now very aware of the comorbidities of neurodiversity. So things like mental health issues, in girls often eating disorders, addictions. And we know that earlier diagnosis has better outcomes for these children. So are you seeing in your professional capacity that children who are diagnosed sooner are having better outcomes? So I think 
what a diagnosis does and the earlier that, that you get it as a child means a school can make the adaptations mm. that it needs to. It also prevents like misdiagnosis as well, which can often happen. And we used to see a few years ago that, you know, our biggest intake in special school was around secondary age. And actually what we're seeing now is that it's it's getting lower and lower and lower. So I'm opening, you know, more schools across the country that start at age four. So we are definitely seeing um, more diagnosis happening and a better understanding of what that looks like. If you know that um, you're working with an individual that's autistic and um, you know what that child needs through reading the assessment report, um, you can tailor their education to be focused around their interests, for example, which will really engage them. And um, from that, you tend to get better outcomes later on. Um, often you see that difficult stage from primary to secondary transition. Um, and obviously the, the younger a child has that sort of support around them, um, the easier they can navigate those sorts of processes as well. And there's an enormous power in knowing who you are, isn't there? And um, Absolutely. You know, how can you possibly navigate a world that isn't really designed for your brain type if you don't know what your brain type is as well? So I, I personally believe that knowledge in, in every area is power, but particularly in understanding who you are. It is. It's it's their identity yeah. at the end of the day. And you know what I would say to any parents listening who are perhaps a bit unsure about whether to seek diagnosis because of the fear of the label is that actually it it opens up a whole new world to those individuals. And I, I can say that through my work and, and what I see every day, but also with my own child. Yeah. Um, it's really transformed his life and his understanding of himself. So really, you know, don't be frightened to go and seek that clarification from someone else. For me personally, it, my parenting style um, changed overnight and everything sort of calmed down. And no, don't get me wrong, it's not perfect, but just understanding that they are different, my children, and, you know, too neurotypical, too neurodivergent. It's, you know, it's fun in my house, you can imagine. But my whole parenting style changed. The my attitude to the restrictive eating, for example, mm -hmm. I used to be in tears at meal times, and now I'm just like, fine, you can eat <laughs> eat honey sandwiches for a month, it's fine. And it's just in, and you can seek additional advice, can't you? I saw a dietitian. There's lots and lots of other professionals that can help you learn how to support your child once you've got that diagnosis. And I'm just wondering, um, what what would you suggest that parents do? So you've you've been given this this diagnosis, you probably are expecting it it's probably not an enormous shock you're reading through it where do you go next what, what's the next stage of the process uh, I think it really depends on the age of the mm. the age of the child or young person and how they're managing in everyday life um so it obviously first thing would be if they're at school to share that with the school um and also if if they're older and uh, they're in the workplace or they're in college, it was also encouraged sharing that so that people can be aware and support them in the in the ways that they need that support. Thank you very much to Freya and Emma for joining me today. Your insight has been absolutely invaluable. Thank you ever so much. If you are interested in knowing what happens next, the natural progression is often an EHCP, which is an educational healthcare plan. And next episode, we're going to be discussing that and how you go about obtaining one and what it might mean for your child. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please like and subscribe. And for more information, please visit the Options Autism website.